Hi, this is Peter Mortola, and this is Play Becomes Real, the Oaklander approach to Gestalt play and art therapy. <clears throat> so this is Play Becomes Real Part 1. It's an introduction. Um, we're going to cover the following, and I'd ask you to identify three answers to each of these following questions. How is play helpful in the therapeutic process? How are the expressive arts helpful in the therapeutic process? What is Violet Oaklander's background? What materials or media are being used in this approach? And what makes Oaklander's approach cross-culturally relevant? Okay, just a brief introduction for myself. I teach here at the grad school in uh, Portland, Oregon, Lewis and Clark Graduate School of Education and Counseling. I teach uh, a variety of classes, <clears throat> including um, a class that meets with these sixth grade students on the floor uh, in counseling groups in a class called Group Counseling with Children and Adolescents. Uh, those are grad students who work with the sixth graders. I um, have also written this text um, with my colleagues Howard Heighton and Stephen Grant. It's uh, about working with boys and uh, a leader's guide to facilitating strength-based groups for boys. So I've also written this book called The Barren Side. I wrote it, Mark Mulchan illustrated it, and it's about working with strong feelings that kids have, especially aggression. I also wrote this book called Window Frames, and this is about Violet Oaklander's work, Learning the Art of Gestalt Play Therapy the Oaklander Way, and I'll be saying more about that as we get into the class and this lecture. So first I want to say a little bit about two aspects, play and expressive art material. So play, people tend to forget that play is serious. David Hockney, a painter, said this, but it relates to developmental psychologists thinking about play as well which is that play is a fundamental and very real and important um, process that kids uh, engage in as they develop, but it's also one that we as older people and adolescents can also um, get benefit from, and we'll be saying more about that as we move through. Just a few points about play. Um, Csikszentmihalyi, who wrote the book Flow, which is a great uh, text in itself says the evolutionary significance of play is not that it maintains an already existing reality but that it provides alternatives to it so there's something about play which allows us as a species to imagine flying when reptiles for example don't really imagine changing their world in that sa same way Winnicott talks about playing and only in playing that the individual child and adult is able to be creative and use the whole personality. And it is only in being creative that the individual discovers the self. So two points here about Winnicott's um, ideas. First, that the whole personality is involved in play. We use our sensory apparatus, we use our imagination, we use our emotions and our thinking, and we integrate all those when we're involved in play. So it's an integrative function. Also, through that participation in play, we discover things about ourselves. We didn't know this about what we felt. We get to try on a new way of being through this role that we take on. So it's a very important process of both discovery and integration. And this is a reference, this photograph, to Oaklander's uh, text called Hidden Treasure, which we'll talk about in a moment. So I want you to notice these the faces on these dog, especially the one on the bottom there, um, you know, it's called the play face. And this phenomena of play could only occur if the participant organisms were capable of some degree of metacommunication, like these dogs are. That is, of exchanging signals which would carry the message, this is play. So this is an important aspect of play too, which is that we connect with others, not just our own discovery of self, but we discover our relationship with others through play. We find out our boundaries. We find out when we've gone too far. We find out what we're made of through engaging in play. So I love the fact that Violet Oaklander in this photograph uh, has the same face as those dogs, that play face. And she says, when I let go and can allow myself to imagine these things, I'm actually coming back to myself because they're always projections. Fantasy gives us access to our own real experience. So this idea that 
is embodied in the, the title of my class, which is that fantasy gives us access to our own real experience. Play somehow connects us to something real and authentic. We'll be spending a lot of time in this class talking about that. Okay, I just want to say a bit about art and uh, expressive arts in general. Um, for one thing, it's a universal. There are no known human cultures in which there cannot be found some form of what we might reasonably term aesthetic or artistic interest, performance, or artifact production. So the fact that it not only reaches across cultures, but it re reaches back in time. We have Paleolithic art. We have you know generations of art making that humans have been involved in as an important cross-cultural and historic uh, medium of expression. And then more up-to-date, looking at brain functioning, one of the most important functions of your unconscious is the processing of data delivered to your eyes. A third of your brain is devoted to processing vision, to interpreting color, detecting edges and motion, perceiving depth and distance, deciding the identity of objects, recognizing faces. So. At a very basic biological level, we are geared for the visual and for images and processing those. And it helps us make sense of the world to do that. And this um, type of uh, expressive art and play approaches to therapy um, enable us to have to make use of those functions. So I just had to throw this image in of my son cozily reading uh, a graphic novel at home. Um, to you know, make the point that we've become, as they say in this quote, we're moving into an age where there's visual, a visual literacy that can go as deep and substantive as prose literacy. People are being raised to think both visually and verbally. The graphic novel does those two things, and the dance of those two produces an experience. So we've become more visual as a culture. We have more, so many media, including graphic novels, but the internet and digital media has allowed this visual understanding of text, of screens and uh, relationship to text that this kind of media, this kind of therapy um, takes advantage of and builds on. Um, but interestingly and contrastingly, not using screens, um, but using, you know, really old methods of visual making. So we're going to talk about drawing, we're going to talk about shaping things from clay, that kind of um, visual image making, is, visual literacy is part of what we're going to be engaged in in this class. This is a really important point. So, you know, many children's books uh, are illustrated and visually based, and this quote is, while the Save Our Children Crusaders were hunting down homosexual propaganda in schools and state houses, Sendok, the illustrator, and the others were hiding it in one place no one bothered to look on their children's nightstands. So the author's talking about uh, in this article the gay history of America's classic children's books, how gay relationships were image, um, the image of those were placed in books even before the words could be spoken in our culture. And that in this way, art often can serve a subversive function. It can serve in a positive way. It can, it can serve an expression of something that is either being squashed or cannot be spoken in a context um, other than maybe the counseling session in, in our case. So this is a, a, an addition to that idea. This is Botticelli's Venus, of course. And the quote is, Autocratics, autocrats from Plato on have advocated control and censorship of the arts to ensure the stability of their states and micromanage their people's inner lives. So over time, there has been the, the inhibition of arts and the, um, the, uh, the control and censorship of the arts. Um, specifically, as one example, you may have heard of the Bonfire of the Vanities. This was in uh, Renaissance Florence. And Botticelli was working at that time as, as there as well as many other artists. And Savonarola, who was a very restrictive um, religious monk, decided that they needed to get rid of all images that were pagan or expressed too much sensuality. And they burned everybody's, um, they went around to the houses and collected people's art and had a bonfire in the middle of the city to burn it. Sadly, Botticelli gave away some of his own work in that repressive movement. But the, the Venus de Milo here did not get burned. So I want to highlight that, again, art can serve a, an expression of, uh, of some things that can't be said in certain contexts, even politically. Okay, 
So what kind of drawing, what kind of materials are we going to use in this class? We're going to use drawing materials. We're going to use um, pastels, uh, hopefully, and crayons and drawing implements of all different types. We're going to incorporate the use of clay. Usually it's pottery clay, um, a very basic and natural uh, substance that comes out of the earth, not made out of petroleum products. We're going to use sand, another natural material, as well as sand tray materials, which are um, often just little um, figurines and toys that can be placed into scenes in a sand scene, and um, we'll learn how to use those materials. Uh, musical instruments are a possibility in this work as well. Um, another expressive media that goes back centuries and across cultures. And picture cards, just stacks of images. Some of you have seen these before. Could be animals, could be people, could be places. Sometimes they're laminated and they're used to um, evoke different um, images and projections using those cards. Puppets are also used. Um, in expressive arts media, uh, we won't be able to get to those this term. Uh, they are, a, I think, a more challenging of the media that we cover, but they do have an important role. Uh, for example, these are puppeteers dressed up as frogs um, protesting a nuclear site, and the caption is, when puppets are outlawed, only outlaws will have puppets. So again, it's a subversive quality that puppets can kind of bring. Sometimes they say things, they act in different ways that are surprising and sometimes um, subversive. All right, so here's Violet Oaklander doing a puppet show during one of her trainings. Uh, I took this photo years ago, and I'm going to use this as a segue to introduce you to Violet's pioneering art and play therapy work. So she taught developmentally challenged children, emotionally disturbed folks in a, in a public school environment for a number of years, moved into therapy, got her MFCC, moved on. She already had an, uh, an MS in special education, finished up her doctorate in clinical, and worked uh, in the Los Angeles area for a number of years before she finished writing her two book, well, her first book in 1978, Windows to Our Children. And then in her companion piece to that first book was Hidden Treasure, which came out in 2008. So she's both a certified play therapy supervisor and a certified gestalt therapist for many years. So this is the first text, Windows to Our Children, still is used in multiple training programs throughout the U.S. and around the world. And I want to um, highlight that by showing the list. So this is the 15 languages that Windows to Our Children has been translated into over time, starting in 1980 with Portuguese and the last version being French in 2014. So here's the cover in Portuguese, Descobrindo Crianças, Discovering Children. Here's what the version looks like in German, Spanish, Ventanas a Nuestros Niños, Italian, Il Gioco Guarasi, The Game or Play Heals in translation, the Hebrew version, Croatian, The Road to the Child's Heart, Russian, the windows to the children with multiple windows. Chinese, windows to our children. And the lovely uh, evocative cover of the Czech version here with the title translating source of the child's soul. The Korean version. I love this Lithuanian clay world cover here, window to the world of children. And the Romanian version. And this one is interesting in that it's the Serbian version that came out during the Serbian-Croatian War during the 90s, and the window is broken. So uh, that was a kind of graphic representation of the conflict that was happening there at the time. And here's the French version, the latest one. So in 2008, she also, 2006, she actually wrote the um, Hidden Treasure, A Map to the Child's Inner Self, which has now also been translated into Spanish. El Tosoro Escondido, German, Raise Hidden Treasures into the Inner World of Children and Adolescents, Russian, Romanian, Hidden Treasure, a Map to the Child Self, and there's an image of the map on the child's hands, Korean, Lithuanian. 
Okay, so she has also been featured in a series called Child Therapy with the Experts. They've had uh, different, you know, family therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, versions, and hers is Gestalt Therapy with Children. Um, this version we'll see a bit of in this class, and we'll also, it's accessible at the um, Lewis and Clark Library. So around her work has developed a foundation of people who have been influenced by her work and want to sustain it over time. Uh, it's called the Violet Solomon Oaklander Foundation, and uh, this is the website. It runs trainings. I'm on the board of this. We put together biannual conferences, um, and if you're interested, you can follow up at that website. So the way I got into this work was by involving myself in um, her intensive summer trainings that happened from 1981 to 2005. I started attending these trainings. I became fascinated by the cross-cultural calling of her work uh, as exhibited in this photograph. Um, internationally attended every year, multiple language being spoken, raised in me the question, what the heck is she talking about that speaks to so many people in so many contexts? This is a couple of women from Ireland here, having just worked with Clay. One of the aspects of Oaklander's work is you can't ask a client to do what you wouldn't be willing to do. So we will be having a very experiential, experiential um, aspect of this class as well. This is a photo of her working with one of our grad students up here in the early 2000s uh, with puppets. She visited Lewis and Clark. And there's a parallel between the way she does child therapy and the way she did training, which I discovered uh, after studying her work for a while. And one was that they both become very playful. They are very playful, and yet they become real. This um, surprising element of play where something becomes authentic and real. Um, they're structural in the sense that it's very structured, but then it's very open-ended. Once, once you're in that structure, you have many ways to move. And they're both indirect in that they're um, speaking through puppets, for example, and yet very authentic statements get made. So we'll be exploring those themes as we move through the course. So I did do this 10-year qualitative study. I completed my dissertation on her work, um, learned some things, shared them with her, made sure she concurred with what I found, and over time then I was able to um, continue my relationship with her. This is her in the uh, just a year or so ago in Los Angeles where she resides with her family. She does occasional trainings now and participates in them. So because of my work with her and my teaching up here at Lewis and Clark, I wrote, based on my dissertation, this book, Window Frames, Learning the Art of Gestalt Play Therapy the Oaklander Way. Um, because I'm writing about somebody famous now, my work has been translated into these following languages. Um, I love this cover. This is from the uh, Chilean Spanish version, which um, turns out to be pirated in that they didn't have official rights to translate it, but I like the fact that my book has a pirated version. This is the official Spanish version from Santi from uh, from um, Spain, and uh, it is uh, uh, interesting to contrast the two Spanish versions. This is the German version, Korean version, and lastly this um, uh, this version from Romania, which I didn't even know existed until a student of mine who was from Romania happened to be looking it up on her home country's website and found it. So I now have my Romanian copy as well. So um, this is a quote from Seema Omar. She talks about using my book and Oaklander's work in Sri Lanka. So I'm really fascinated by this reach of her work. As I mentioned, I teach here at Lewis and Clark. Here's an example of doing sand tray on campus. I also have taught at Idaho State most summers over the past five years, um, teaching short classes on her approach as well. This is a presentation I did with the British Columbia Play Therapy Association. And I've taught for a couple of years in Mexico uh, where her work is really warmly embraced as well as it is in Brisbane, where I taught um, a number of years ago with a group of therapists. So this question of the cross-cultural relevance is part of what I want to step into now. Why is her work so relevant to so many different um, cultures and languages across the world? 
I'm going to use one example to talk about specifics, but see if they can generalize, which is that I got to go to South Africa with Violet in 2000. We did three trainings um, in Pretoria, Bloemfontein, and Cape Town. Uh, 100 to 300 participants in each of those. An amazing, um, you know, across the world, different language, different culture, and yet there's something about her work there that has resonated. So what I found when I did focus group interviews with the folks in South Africa was a certain a number of themes. One is that this, this idea of indirect contact. So Siza, one of the participants in South Africa said, in my culture, as a child, you are taught not to look directly in the eyes of an adult. Our children seem to look down when they talk to an adult or person or a man. So in Violet's work, it is very helpful because the child always has something to look at rather than talking directly with the therapist. So just as these two ladies in Mexico are not gazing at each other, they're looking at an image, a shared image on the floor, it allows this um, distancing from the intense eye contact that therapy also a talk therapy model would maybe um, focus on. And I think in that way, there is this uh, potential for even greater authentic contact when the work is done indirectly. And we'll say more about that. So another aspect is showing, not telling. So Alice says, C2 families have certain rules. They don't speak easily about feelings. You might show it, but you can't really talk about it. That's the rule. They actually have very few words to describe feelings. So I might ask, draw some anger for me. And it comes out quite easily because their definition of an emotion is visual. So the sense that words sometimes fail us and images can convey something more directly, showing, not telling. The third aspect is this integration of both sensory nature and pretend play. So very basic materials, sometimes sticks and rocks, as this quote from Taba, when I run my groups, they like to play with and make pictures with stones and sand and leaves and different pieces of nature. They'd rather use those than crayons. And if I do exercises that include animal projections, they can easily dialogue with those images and express emotions that way. So this approach, you need materials, you need expressive materials like the drawing or clay or sand tray, but you actually don't need fancy materials that nature, um, any kind of sensory engagement, I think, helps this pretend play. And this is an example of how cross-culturally, it doesn't matter what materials you're using, um, that children will engage in that, that same kind of play, um, even with natural materials. So this was a quite moving statement by Jabu. She worked with this piece of clay that she's got on her paper plate there. This clay in, in South Africa was actually pulled from riverbeds right near the where the presentations happened. Um, so it was native clay, which I thought was really lovely. And she finished her work, and when we were reflecting on it, she said, you know, clay therapy with the mud can restore children to or help them to discover a new world of childhood. I find that this kind of experience is actually lost to them. I can't even say they've lost it. I don't even know that they know or that they've had this experience before. So what she was referring to was the way in which children in South Africa, it is not as safe as it was for them to go out into riverbeds and collect clay and make objects and have that sensorily, sensorily engaged um, play process because it's not as safe an environment. And it makes me think about cities around the world now where children don't have the same kind of tactile possibilities that this kind of therapy can bring back to, as, she, as Jabu says, restore a, a, or even just introduce them to this kind of experience, which is necessary for development. Okay, so here's Violet again. When I let go and can allow myself to imagine these things, I'm actually coming back to myself because they're always projections. Fantasy gives us access to our own real experience. So I think that idea of fantasy becoming real, play becoming real, is a recurrent theme that uh, we will be exploring throughout the course. So I've tried to go over these particular um, points during this introduction as a summary. How is play helpful in the therapeutic process? How are the expressive arts helpful in the therapeutic process? What is Violet Oaklander's background? What materials or media are used in this approach? and what makes Oaklander's approach cross-culturally relevant. So thank you for your attention to this introduction. 
Um, this is completing the intro segment, and we will have another segment coming soon.